of, uh, of the work you're doing here, brother, yes, yes, thank you. Uh, to restore greatness, to restore consciousness to the Mortar City. And we, need, yes, we, we do need clones of you out here because you can't do this work by yourself. Right. It's hard when, when you're trying to be correct, when you're fighting injustice, when you seem to be doing it by yourself because others are afraid or they don't understand what the issues are, so they stand on the sidelines talking about you. As opposed to stepping up and walking with you and fighting well, with you. But, but that's the way it's always been. That's yes, right. And it's always taken a handful of people to set something in motion to change the world. And then the rest of the people jump on the bandwagon and say, well, I was there all along. Mm -hmm. But we understand. We understand. Yes. I'm so pleased to be here. Uh, sorry I was a little late. I was up, up in, um, in Flint for the last three days doing some workshops and presentations there. Yeah. You live in Flint? Do you know Miss Deloney? Yeah. Well, she, she brings... And, and, uh, okay, well, Miss Deloney's been bringing me in for like the last 10 years, coming up to Flint, doing some work with, uh, with a number of, the, uh, number of her people. So uh, I'll probably be back at least twice before the end of the year. So I'm really pleased that Brother Malik uh, had me come in and see you before I, I went back home. I leave for, for D.C. tomorrow. But, um, you know, Detroit is like my, my third home. I'm, I'm born and raised from Chicago. Uh, and used to spend my summers in between Detroit and Mount Clemens, Michigan. My you know, great grandmother, cousins, and everybody lives up there. So uh, Detroit is like home to me uh, on so many different levels. But I'm really pleased to be here and to talk to you about a number of things that, that are of interest to me. M many of y'all know me as a uh, as a historian, as a writer, someone who talks about African and African American history and culture, about Kemet. But um, you know. At, at my heart, at my essence, I'm really an artist. I was trained as an artist. Uh, my degree from Howard University is in graphic design and advertising. And one of the things that I've done, once I began to cultivate an understanding of our history and culture, is to use my artistic and design skills to write and produce historical materials and make it palatable to our people so that we'll pick up a book and read a book. So I use my design skills to disseminate our information. And what I've been finding myself doing now over the last three or four years is to going back to my artistic roots, my design roots, to teach history by, by talking about art, specifically by talking about the media. Some of you all may remember the piece that I did a couple of years ago on Avatar. Yes. Talking about looking at Avatar, looking at this phenomenal movie. It is a phenomenal movie, truly phenomenal movie. And what disturbed me is that in overhearing conversations by some of our people about the movie, they got, they saw a different movie than what I saw. So I did that lecture to talk about the African history and culture and spiritual traditions that were in that movie and how I firmly believe that the ancestors used James Cameron in order to transmit a message about oppressed people overthrowing their oppression. That's what the movie is all about. That's what the movie is all about. So That's we right. have to begin to understand how powerful the media is and how it has been used as a tool of oppression and can be used as a tool of liberation. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to share with you all in uh, this two-part presentation is, first of all, a discussion about, about the media and how the media has been used to oppress us, mm -hmm. how we have to be able to identify the multiple means of oppression so that we can begin to develop strategies to minimize the oppression and then begin to empower ourselves. And more importantly than that is the issue of how we have to, how we must protect our children from the poison, from the pornography, which some folk call music. Mm. It is destroying our children. And I want to show you, I want to, to share with you uh, the cause and effects relationship of the unchecked consumption of media. And how it destroys us, how it destroys our children. So this presentation I'm doing this evening, I'm dedicating in honor of, of this brother here. How many of you all know this brother? Yes. Right, we got a brother few people here. Choice. Brother Sam Yet. Sam Yet wrote The Choice um, in the early 70s. When I was a student at Howard, he was one of the professors over in Howard School of Communication. Dr. Sam Yet, who passed away last January, was the first African-American uh, to write for Newsweek magazine. And while he was working for Newsweek magazine, he was also researching among government archives uh, the extent to which the United States government was literally um, plotting, developing plans to destroy black folk. 
and he documented this, uh, his, his research in a book called The Choice. And he said, once you really understand the nature of this government, now this government is hell-bent on destroying you, then you as black people, you got a choice to make. Whether you're going to leave here or live here. And if you're going to live here, you've got to determine how you're going to live here so that you can prevent yourself from being annihilated by a government which does not have your best interests at heart. And as a result of writing that book, he was fired from Newsweek. Mm. Sued them and ultimately won his suit. So in, in honor of the spirit of Dr. Yet, who's been, who's been fighting this fight for decades, I dedicate this presentation to him because we still have a choice to make. That's right. We still are fighting a fight. And so, uh, what I want to talk about is ways to counteract the negative perceptions of blacks in the media. The media is the most powerful form of mental manipulation ever created by human beings on this planet. And if we study the media, we will see that there has been a concerted effort over the years to destroy us mentally by creating and projecting and perpetuating negative images of us. And see, the issue is what you see in the media, you believe. You believe. And so, you know, let me just give you some examples. We have to look at what Hollywood acknowledges is a threat to us. Precious, one of the worst movies ever made. That's right. Won mm -hmm. an Academy Award. Monsters Ball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Won an Academy Award. The Blind Side. Hustle and Flow, all of these movies depict us in ways that would make George Wallace proud. And the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences gave them Oscars because of how they put us down. And we have to be conscious of that and make a decision not to support those films that depict us in a negative light. We've got to show our children that we're willing to stand up for what is right so that they will have a model to follow. And then also, <laughs> hey, it's not helping us. You know, we need to understand. And, and, I, and I, I submit to you, you know, I've been around long enough. I, I, I just turned 60 last year, so I've been around long enough to be able to remember when Amos, Amos and Andy was on television in the 1950s and how the NAACP and other conscious organizations at that time protested to get their program off the air. And what I'm seeing now in the media, in movies and in television, is a return to images that are worse than Amos and Andy. Mm -hmm. That's right. And what is happening, the message that, 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 that I see, what I interpret from this, is that we, uh, this country is preparing itself for a return to the good old days mm -hmm. when y'all knew your place. Mm -hmm. And all of these images in the media are designed to make you complacent, uh, to make others see you in an inferior light so that they will feel comfortable when the government moves on all of us. Mm -hmm. When they move on all of us. So, you know, psychological warfare is probably one of the most important components in any conflict. You work on people's mind before you destroy them physically. So we have to take note of what is happening and begin to prepare ourselves or begin to make a choice as to what we're going to do. Because we're in a situation where either you, <laughs> either you fight or you flee. And y'all better have a passport. How many of y'all in this room have a passport? In my next room, y'all need to have a passport. Because when the time comes, <laughs> <laughs> if Barack Obama, if Barack Obama is not re-elected president, I'm leaving the United States in December. You can bet on that. Because I, I won't want to live here. If folk have plans for y'all. Mm -hmm. You may not have plans for yourself, but folks got plans for you. And you better get ready. So then, uh, this presentation is dedicated to two of my homeboys from Chicago, Dr. Juwanza Kujufu. We wrote the classic countering the conspiracy to destroy black boys. Yes. And a new yeah. classic, um, Tom Morell, author Brainwash. Mm -hmm. Morell's book um, came out two years ago. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Tom Morell, Tom Morell in 1972, I believe it was, established Morell Communications, which is one of the uh, first black-owned advertising agencies uh, in the country. 
And when he retired in 2005, it was the most successful black advertising agency in the world. So he was responsible for marketing, uh, working with Fortune 500 companies to market their products to the African American community. So he knows advertising inside and out. And after he, um, he stepped down from his company, he wrote this book, Brainwash, Challenging the Myth of Black Inferiority, where he focused specifically on the strategies that are used by the media in order to um, plant in your mind, plant in your consciousness, this concept of inferiority. It's a powerful book, very important book. I okay. often refer to it as the miseducation of the Negro for the 21st century. He lays out the process of miseducation. He talks about the short-term and long-term implications of this psychological warfare that's been waged on black folk. And in the last chapter of the book, which makes me you know, appreciate it so much more, in the last chapter of the book, he gives us solutions, talks about things that we can do. And as a master of the media, he specifically talks about how we can use the media, how we can use this technology to reverse this downward spiral. So we don't have to always just sit back and play the victim and talk about what others are doing to us. We can be proactive. Yes. There are things we can be and should be doing right now in order to turn this thing around. So I, uh, this, this piece was inspired by the works of these two men. So, let me just give you a couple of quotes from, from Brainwash to set the framework for what uh, we're looking at. He says, of all the disciplines and forces there are for change, none is more powerful for good or evil than propaganda. Mm -hmm. See, propaganda is not necessarily a bad thing. That's right. It all depends on how you use it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Propaganda, the strategic planning and placement of words and images is all about working on your psyche, getting inside of your head and getting things, getting you to do things on a subconscious level. You don't even think about it. You do it automatically. That is how the media works. That is why it's one of the most powerful means of manipulation ever created by humans on the planet. And for the most part, up until the advent of, of uh, cable. That's why television is free. That's why radio is free. It ain't nothing free in America. You gotta ask yourself, what are you paying when you turn on the radio for free? It's about advertising. It's about marketing. It's about people producing products to get inside of your head and to separate you from your money. Get you to buy things you don't need, oftentimes for people you don't even like. It's a powerful force. So he goes on to say that linking the right pictures and words at the right time has the potent ability to persuade, to influence behaviors, and engender the courage to change the world for good or for evil, depending on the intent of the person who is putting this information out here. And we should know, we should be very clear that much of the media that we are exposed to, that our children are exposed to, is media that is designed to minimize their potential as human beings and to program them to function on a subhuman level and to believe that that's normal. Mm. That's been happening, that's been the program that has been running for at least two generations. At least two generations. So it's going to be a very difficult program to break and it also means that we've got to begin to start working on the little ones to separate them from what we know is detrimental to their well-being so that they will have an opportunity to survive and begin to grow up to be productive citizens of Detroit, of Michigan, of the United States, of the world. That's our responsibility. We have to take ownership of their lives by controlling what comes into their minds. This is serious business. Very serious business. And so... I'd like to quote uh, my sister Angela Bassett, who made this statement when she declined the role that was offered to her to play the lead in the film Monsters Ball, the lead that Halle Berry went on to receive an Oscar for. Angela Bassett read the script and she said, No, I'm not feeling this. I'm tired of seeing my sisters presented as whores and prostitutes mm. on the silver. I'm not doing this. We deserve better. Film is forever. Long after she is dead and gone, 
This film will run on cable stations. It will be sold as DVDs for hundreds and hundreds of years. And if the worst should happen, if black people are exterminated in the United States, they will have these films to show to justify why we were removed. That's how powerful this game is. That's how powerful, that's how important these issues are. You can't just sit back and say, it's just a movie. No. Mm. If it's just a movie, then why don't we see other cultures depicted in a similarly uh, disgraceful manner? If it's just a song, then why have we never heard any of these, these rappers, these thugs, these gangsters talk about Jews? Huh? They won't allow it. Because they understand the power of words, the power of images. And they would do whatever is necessary to defend themselves. So we have to learn some lessons. So then, we got to ask some questions, some very basic questions. How has the media been used as a force of evil in the black community? We have to question everything we see. We have to ask ourselves, what is the cause and effect relationship between unsupervised media consumption and disruptive behavior among our youth? Because those of you all who are 50 and older know that something ain't right with these young folk out here. They are different than any other young folk that we have produced. Something is wrong. And I submit to you the thing that is wrong is that we have turned them over to the television. We have turned them over to these iPods and these CDs which has sucked the consciousness out of their brains. And turned them into self destructive beings who destroy everything in their midst and don't give it a second thought. These are our children I'm talking about. We brought them into this world. We allowed them to be turned. And we have a responsibility to do something about it. And so I um I had a conversation with, uh, with, with, with Tom uh, a couple of years ago. We were talking about how the media impacts the behavior of youth in Chicago. Because there's been a lot, of, you know, a lot of violence in Chicago. There's a lot of violence here in Detroit, but there's a lot of violence in Chicago. And we're trying to understand what is causing these children to act in such a way. And so, you know, what we have to begin to look at and, and some questions that we have to begin to ask ourselves are, who have been responsible for the greatest number of deaths of black males in the 20th century? There are more black males dying now than at any point in time in history. So who's been responsible for their deaths? Has it been the Ku Klux Klan? Or has it been Snoop Doggy Dog and 50 Cent? This nonsense that these people produce, that these people produce, have led us into a situation where we don't even recognize our children anymore. Mm. They want to be thugs. They want to be gangsters. And they don't even know the meaning of these things that they want to be. Anybody know what a thug is? Does anybody know what a thug is? Part of a cult? Killer. Historically, brother, it comes from the thuggies, mm -hmm. and murderers, and um, uh, they were assassins. Um, uh, I mean, I'm slipping on the culture now. Right. That's the, that's Stays out of India. Right. It's India. Sanskrit. Thug is a Sanskrit word which means, literally means, an agent of the devil. Mm -hmm. An agent of the devil. Mm. Someone who exists only to create evil, death and destruction. So how can we allow our children to listen to people who claim that this is, this is who they are? They're living a thug life. And we try to glorify that. There's nothing to glorify. Because it's anti-life. And when we look at this behavior, we have to be able to analyze the results of this behavior in our community. Do you realize 
Do you realize that over 7,000 black males are killed annually in the United States? 7,000. <laughs> Which means that in the past decade, 70,000 black folk, mostly between the ages of 17 and 44, have been killed by other black males. That's more than the lives that were lost during the Vietnam War. Mm. Now, if it was white folk who were dying, white males who were dying, there would be a national inquiry, a national investigation. Mm -hmm. But as long as it's us killing us, don't nobody care. And sad to say, we don't seem to care. Mm -hmm. These are our children. These are our sons, our nephews, our brothers. And I know, you know, a lot of us are suffering from battle fatigue. But the only way this situation is going to change is if we decide to change it. Because if we leave it to Romney or Santorum yeah. or some of these other folk, the best way to resolve the problem is to get rid of all black folk. The easiest way to get rid of the problem is to get rid of all black folk. So if we don't correct the problem, somebody else is going to step in and correct it. So we've got things that we have to take care of. Business that we have to take care of. And so... I had a conversation uh, two years ago with, um, last year as a matter of fact, with, with Tom. And he was, he was talking about, he was describing a uh, recent spate of, of, of killings in Chicago. And he was sharing with me what he believes the motivation was for these young people killing, them, killing other, uh, other black boys. This was, do you all remember uh, a couple of years ago, a 14 year old, um, high school student named Darian Albert mm -hmm. was beaten to death on the south side of Chicago. Yep. It was on YouTube. All right. it on yeah, it's, it's, it's still on YouTube. And so he was talking about this death and said, you know, you know, and he was beaten to death with like a railroad tie, like a, like a two by four. You know, and, and what would cause folk to just aggress like that? A bunch of kids out in the street beating each other with sticks. What could be the motivation of that? And he was describing to me this video that he had seen, this new video, it was new at that time, it had just been released in August of 2010, a video by Jay-Z called We Run This Town. Mm. Now, I had never seen it because I, I don't watch that. I love, myself to, I love myself too much to internalize poison. I stay away from it because I know it's not good for me. But he was describing the scenes in this video where there was this mob scene. And usually when you see a mob, you see a mob with guns or, or knives. But these folk had clubs. And he was saying that that was, that was possibly the inspiration for these young children mimicking this mob behavior. And as he described that video, I said, Tom, you know, that sounds an awful lot like a movie that I just saw recently. It was an old film. I you know, just happened to turn on the tube and watch this movie, The Gangs of New York. Mm. And I, I, I guarantee you that the director of the Jay-Z video, We Run This Town, was inspired by this film, The Games of New York. So what I want to do is to show you clips from these three pieces. A clip from We Run This Town, a clip from The Games of New York, and a news clip of the murder of Darian Albert. And I want you all to see, witness with your own eyes, the cause and effect relationship between young, impressionable minds internalizing violence, pornographic violence, and then acting it out because they believe that it is normal. So let's, um, let's watch this.
so y'all can, can get the feel for the video. And now I want to show you a clip from a um, preview of Gangs of New York so you can see the inspiration for this video. <laughs> Like this, not even going. 